We are going live now, Dr. Kenelwi. Uh, I'm going to introduce you, huh? Okay. السلام عليكم الاخوه آه والاخوات آه متابعي صفحه آه سودان اركتكشر فورم منتدى السودان للعماره آه يسعدنا ان نستضيفكم اليوم في آه ويبينار بعنوان ديزاين ثينكينج آه احد الادوات الجديده والحديثه آه في ايجاد حلول لل للمشاكل في إيجاد حلول للمشاكل الاقتصادية والاجتماعية والتنموية معانا اليوم الدكتورة كينيلوي ميني she is a doctor from we have today we are hosting Dr. Kinelwi from University of Cape Town she is a lecturer in design thinking uh, and human-centered uh, design thinking approach. And she is also uh, a lecturer in sustainability in the Sustainability Institute uh, and uh, in transdisciplinary design issues. Uh, so uh, Dr. Kinelwi is pioneering in this new field and she will give us introduction and overview about what did they think about and how uh, us as Sudanese can benefit from that. And we'll, she will shed also the light on some uh, experience from Africa and worldwide. Uh, we are more than glad to host uh, this uh, international expertise today. And we're looking forward for further engagement with her in the future. And we welcome, we would like to welcome her one day to Sudan to come and deliver uh, uh, lectures and events uh, to the uh, to the students and to the graduates to uh, educate them more about this topic. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Kinelwi, uh, and you have the option also to share the screen. And uh, you are a co-host, and you can present and you can control as well. Great, thank, thank you. you so much. Um... Good evening, everybody. Uh, greetings from the very cold um, and rainy Cape Town. Um, as you've already heard, um, I work in a lot of different spaces. And the core of my work is to train and capacitate um, individuals and organizations in human-centered design uh, mindset and in the design thinking process. I am going to take you through a presentation. I will be sharing my screen now uh, with you. So in terms of the um, presentation itself, I'm gonna take you through the introduction and then later on, I will be um, highlighting some of the projects of, or some of the examples of um, where the, the approach has been applied. And um, yeah, I look forward to engaging with you all and um, perhaps even sharing what I know or what I do. Okay. So I wanna start my presentation with this um, African proverb, which says, turn your, turn your face to the sun and the shadow will fall behind you. And this speaks to the importance of being optimistic. We have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of issues that we have to grapple with on a daily basis. 
And sometimes we forget that they still, you know, a um, they still a light, a light at the end of the tunnel. So just something to remind us. And um, and of course, one of the reasons why we are all anxious and uh, concerned is because we have we're living in this new world, which is known as the VUCA world where there is volatility, there is uncertainty, there is complexity, and there is ambiguity as well. And of course, when you talk about volatility, we're talking at the, about the speed at which things change in society, in communities, in organizations. And of course, uncertainty where there is no concrete uh, trends to follow. And when you're talking about complexity, we're talking about situations where there's multiple perspectives and stakeholders involved. And of course, there's also um, 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 ambiguity as well, which is about um, multiple interpretations. What does this actually mean for you as an individual, for your leadership, if you are in a leadership position? but also for your strategy as an organization, because we cannot dwell on the fact that we live in a, in a VUCA world. We also need to innovate. We need to come up with strategies in order for us to be able to navigate um, this new normal. So what this, the reframing, and in design thinking, we talk a lot about reframing, the, the importance of reframing, not only focus on the negative, but also try and, um, identify the positives as well. So when we reframe the VUCA world, it's about creating a vision, painting a clear picture of the future you want, and then creating an understanding, understanding the connections and making them transparent. And then uh, the clarity is about uh, simplicity, focusing on what counts and what is it really about. So what do you want to achieve? And of course, trust is one key element of this and transparency as well. And then flexibility and agility. So it's important um, to be flexible because things are changing so quickly, being able to adapt and, and, and change is quite important. And of course, um, design becomes very critical when we are dealing with wicked problems. And when we're talking about wicked problems, we're talking about problems that are unique where there is no clear definition and there are multiple causal um, and they, they, they are interconnected to other issues. There are multiple stakeholders involved with conflicting agendas and opinions. And of course, they also straddle organizational and disciplinary boundaries. And so um, typically this is what, um, when we're talking about wicked problems, this is what wicked problems refer to. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that or you are experiencing that on a daily basis, whether it's in your work environment or in the community that you live in, these have become part of who we are. Every society, every community is experiencing them. And of course, it, they also present an opportunity for us to innovate. And of course, one of the key, at least the one that I feel strongly about on the African continent is the issue of unemployment. I think it's one of the biggest um, wicked problems that we have to deal with. So you have a population of 1.2 million and 1.2 billion, sorry. And then uh, 420 million of those are young people and one third are unemployed, which is a real serious problem that requires us to come up um, with solutions to it. And of course, Einstein says we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. This is where innovation comes to play. So we need to change our strategies. We need to find new ways of doing things and new ways of working. And of course, how can we achieve that? Design has always played a critical role in changing situations. We all know or we've heard about um, industrial revol revolution, which was about bringing the machinery um, to increase the speed and uh, volumes of productions. 
And then we've heard about the arts and crafts movement, which was a, a rebellion against the age of mass production. And then we've also heard about the Bauhaus movement, um, where it was about um, uh, stripping design down to its essentials, about simplicity and clarity and minimalism. And of course, now we are in the age of social networks and, and social um, where it's about connecting us in different parts of the world and bringing people together using technology. And of course, there's also the Green Revol uh, Revolution as well, where it's about um, bringing nature into the living, the live spaces or the environment or um, making sure that we have, we live in unison with nature as, um, and design plays a critical role in those spaces as well. So when we're talking about a de design revolution, we're talking about a response to mounting crisis. It involves a, uh, the proposal of new perspectives um, and challenging assumptions. And of course, the expectations of design. A lot of the times the expectation is that design is gonna, it's, it only applies to designing physical things or tangible products, but design is also a way of thinking and working. Okay. So when you're talking about um, a design revolution is a revolution that is intended on focusing on designing for pa participation, understanding, and innovation to tackle complex problems in order to meet human needs. And it integrates um, cumulative and disruptive innovation. So in some cases we can use incremental approaches to, to innovate, whereas in some cases there might be a need to disrupt systems or disrupt what already exists. So key to innovation is the notion of unlearning so not dwelling on what we already know, but allowing ourselves and opening ourselves up to learning new ways of doing things and new ways of working. And of course, Africans say you cannot discover new oceans unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. So allowing yourself and letting go of what you know, because like I said, with the quote from Einstein, we have to, we cannot be trying to come up with new ways of doing things and new solutions using um, the same kind of thinking that we used when we created those problems. It requires us to completely change our mindset. And of course, I love this quote that says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot um, learn, unlearn, and relearn. And once again, reiterating the importance of unlearning and relearning in order for us to be able to innovate. And then what about design? Um, and of course, essentially what design is all about, it's about um, being in the world. And this tells us um, that design is a reaction to us being thrown into the world. So on a philosophical level, design is fundamental to the way we deal with the world around us. So it's not just about um, eye candy. It's not just about um, you know, physical products and services and so forth. It's also about um, designing the world around us so that it meets our needs, our human needs. So design is an innovation process. Um, it's about um, transforming organizations. It's about communi transforming communities, developing products and services, of course, as well. Um, it is the process of creating better solutions. So now we are surrounded by uh, success and the embracing of design. And in, in my presentation later on, I'll share some of the examples that I've, um, of the projects that I've worked in to show you the wide applicability of design. And of course, then this also changes the role of a designer. A designer becomes a facilitator, a champion of human empathy 
and a guardian of quality and simplicity. So there's this um, design Danish, it's called the Danish design ladder. If you look at um, this ladder, it shows you the different levels of design. So there's a, a level one where typically there is no appreciation of design. And then there's design and styling. And that's what a lot of people associate design with. But now there's also the growing realization that design as an innovation process is very important. And what makes it even more important is the fact that it's not dependent on designers driving it. It's basically anyone can learn the process and, and be able to apply, apply it in their own um, context. And of course, there's also design as strategy. So there's also a growing interest in, in organizations to use the same design um, principles to develop their own strategies. And then of course, um, step five is um, design is community and organization transformation. So here, I, once again, working with communities to co-create um, solutions to local problems. And then the last one is using design as national competitive strategy. So this is a playing using design at a policy level. And a lot of African countries are still below the dotted line, whereas a lot of Scandinavian countries are playing are more at um, level six, where they are now they have embraced design as a national competitive strategy. So we have um, some way to go in on the African continent to start embracing design and seeing um, the value of design. So when we're talking, when I'm talking about design. I am talking about a mindset, skill set, critical thinking, and creativity combined, which is more than aesthetics, which is what a lot of people would associate design with. So when you're talking about um, the head, it's about problem solving. So the ability and design is very um, useful when it comes to problem solving because we have all these tools and ways of working so the ability to visualize and conceptualize the intangible, that's the value of design. And then the heart, it's about people. So putting people at the center, the passion and curiosity to design solutions that meet the needs of the people is quite important and it's critical and it's an essential part of design and designing solutions. And then of course, there's the, the, the hand or the practical skills. So the technical ability that en enables us um, to achieve whatever goal we're trying to achieve is quite important. These are some of the key aspects as well to design as a, to the design process. So problem solving, once again, empathy, because you need to be able to understand who are the people that you are trying to solve um, the problem for and what are their lived experiences before you jump into solution and I know that a lot of us have been trained to develop solutions and so it's natural when we are given a, a problem the first thing we think of is solutions but what this approach is trying to get us to do is to actually spend time to understand the problem that we are trying to solve first and understand who are the people involved and what is the context in which the problem exists in. And then of course, um, and that's what helps build empathy. Empath empathy is about, at the core of empathy is understanding. And then of course, creativity is important as well. So in the process of trying to understand the problem, you use creativity as well as when you are developing solution. And then collaboration, this is a team sport. Maybe that is the best way to um, capture it. It's not something that you do on your own. You need other people that can bring in different perspectives and different ways of working. And I'm gonna talk more about that a little bit later. And of course, it's also about creating agency. So not waiting for somebody else to 
solve a problem, but tackling the problem and starting um, to explore possible solutions to a problem. So now talking about um, the human-centered aspect of the approach. So human-centered design is a mindset and an approach to problem solving and innovation that focuses on people when designing, whether it's a product, system, service, it's about starting with understanding and establishing who the people are. And then the mindset is based on a set of values that require humility and integrity to do it right. So the, the, the mindset also offers um, systems thinking tools to help because when you are trying to solve a problem, there's a lot of information that is being generated as well. So it gives you the tools and ways of navigating the complexity and managing the complexity. Um, so it is an approach to problem solving that focuses on human values. And of course, like I said, design offers a way of thinking about the world that is significant to uh, addressing some of the problems that we face. And what about um, design thinking? It sounds new to a lot of people, but it has a very long, um, it dates back to um, the 1950s, where at the beginning it was about um, trying to understand what, what design is, what is design actually all about? And then in the 1960s, um, it was more around um, looking at um, the design science, the actual science of designing the process and um, how do designers actually work. So understanding the ways of working. And then of course, in the 1980s, it became more around um, participatory processes. So instead of designers sitting by themselves and developing all these solutions, in their studios, actually getting designers to bring in different perspectives or to work with different stakeholders that are impacted by the problem. And then in the 1990s, it became a lot about the process. So what is the actual process that any other person can do? So what is the typical process that the designers follow? And then of course, in the 2000s, it became a lot about the mindset. So what is the mindset that you need to have in order for you to be able to innovate and solve complex problems? So design thinking is a combination of different layers. One is the mindset, one, and then the methods and the culture. And it works better or works best when you are fully into all these levels. So not only one aspect of it, but you need all of them in order for it to work, okay? And historically, the term um, design thinking was used to describe the techniques and methodology, methodologies employed by um, designers to create abstract services and experiences. Now it has become so much broader than that. And of course, at the core of it is to improve the quality of life for people and the planet. And of course, to also remember that we can use the approach to design the way we lead, design the way we manage others or projects or whatever it is that we are working on in order to create and, um, and innovate. And of course, the design, um, the design thinking approach can also be applied to systems, procedures, protocols, um, customer experiences, and so forth. And of course, like I said, I will share um, some examples. And of course, um, so design thinking refers to cognitive activities that designers apply during the process of designing um, services and systems. It is a formal method for practical creative solution um, to uh, developing solutions to problems. And it is solution-based and solution-focused thinking. It differs a lot from analytical thinking, which um, begins with thoroughly defining all the parameters 
with design thinking, we use what is known as abductive reasoning. And I am gonna talk more about this um, later. And of course, the process is iterative. So you go through iterative um, rounds to develop a solution. So it's not a linear, it's not a linear process. So when we talk about abductive re reasoning, what that means um, is that a lot of the times we're not sure which problem we should be focusing our energies on. And we're not sure what the solution is gonna be, but we follow a process. So there's two approaches to abductive reasoning. The first one is where we don't know what the problem is for sure. Maybe we have an area of interest and then we don't know what the actual solution is gonna be. But through the application of the process, we get to understand what is the problem that we should be focusing on and therefore develop the solution, the right solution to that problem. And then the second um, aspect to abductive reasoning is where we know the outcome that we wanna achieve, but we don't know for sure what the problem is, but we follow a process again, which will help us understand the problem and come up with the, with the right solution to that particular problem. And his thoughts has written a lot about um, abductive reasoning. So just to just um, to reiterate the difference in terms of the, the um, different types of reasoning. So typically uh, mathematicians will focus on deductive um, reasoning and then uh, natural science, science would focus on inductive. Whereas in design thinking, again, in design, in most cases we use what is known as abductive reasoning. So in terms of the different kinds of thinking, engineers will typically solve their way forward. And business thinking is about optimizing your way forward. And research thinking is about analyzing your way forward. Design thinking on the other hand is about building your way forward. So quickly experimenting and building small experiments in order to test and learn as fast as you can and see whether something is gonna work or not before investing a lot of time, money and resources on it. And of course, there are two approaches to the design thinking approach, depending on the context of the project that you are working on or problem that you are trying to solve. One is designing with and the other is designing for. Designing with means that as a designer, you, um, you focus on participation. So you make sure that um, you involve the people that you're designing for so that they become active co-creators of um, so the solution that you're trying to develop. And then designing for is um, the, the traditional approach or the typical approach where um, a team might be working in a studio somewhere, but even if they are working in a studio somewhere, the approach forces you to actually go out and engage with um, the people involved. So in, in the designing with, it means that you're actually you're actually going into the community to co-create with the communities to develop a solution. And designing for, on the other hand, is that it, it just means that as a team, you can be based in a studio somewhere, but you still need to go out and test your ideas with the people that you're designing for. And of course, Africans say, a wise man never knows all, only fools know everything. Meaning it is important to get out and learn from the people themselves because even communities are experts in their own lives. So if you wanna design a solution that really works and that really meets the needs of the people, then it's important to get out of your studio to go and learn from the um, communities as well. And of course, when we are tackling uh, wicked problems, it's not about designing for everyone. We don't want a solution like the one that I'm showing here, where it's, it's um, this 
broad and big um, thing, we want to make sure that the solution is focused. So to remember, at least it, it, I would like to um, mention this, that inclusive design is in designing one thing for all people. It is designing a variety of things so that all can participate. And when you are uh, tackling wicked problems, this becomes even more critical because typically these problems are complex and they can never be fully solved. And therefore coming up with multiple solutions or a variety of solutions is what will make a difference in the long run. And that's what we aim for as opposed to one solution because there is no such thing for wicked problems as one solution for all. So we try and avoid that by creating multiple interventions. And in the long run, those multiple interventions, they contribute towards making a difference. These are the key um, elements to designing for participation um, or why participatory design is so important is that it can reduce the risk of failure and consequently the cost. It can also build ownership of the outcomes. That is why the designing with approach is the one that resonates with me the most because you want communities to take ownership of the outcomes that you are developing. And it can also boost confidence and self-reliance. If people are part of the process of developing solutions, they're likely to grow and start realizing that they have it in themselves. They have the ability to um, develop or co-create solutions. And participation can also enable realistic expectations to form and lower resistance to change. If a person, if a community is part of developing a, sol a solution, they are likely to embrace the change than being told or just being um, given a solution, which is why a lot of the times the top-down um, approaches to problem solving don't actually work. Years later, you find people still talking about exactly the same problem that existed a long time ago. It's because a lot of the times we don't engage or bring in those that are impacted by the problem. And of course, what um, participation does as well, it can foster stronger bonds and in turn, greater community involvement. And that is ultimately what we want. So in terms of the, um, the key components of it is having a clear proce uh, process to follow and having key principles and then of course the methods and tools and having the right facilitator to facilitate the process and make sure that everybody is involved and that all the voices are heard is quite important. So when we're looking, moving on to the actual process. So what does the, I've been talking a lot about the other, the key elements to the human centered design and design thinking process. But what does the actual process um, look like? Now that's what my, um, the next bit of my presentation is gonna be focusing on. First thing, or the first key ingredient is people. Having the right people is important and starting with people as you try and solve the problem is important. So our entry point to the process of um, solving the problems is with people understanding the desirability. So understanding how people are experiencing the problem that they are trying to solve is quite important. Doesn't mean that we're forgetting about uh, business viability and technological feasibility, but we bring them a little bit later once we've understood what the problem is. And of course, um, impact is important as well. So essentially what this approach that is all about is about finding a sweet spot. So whatever innovation that you come up with, it has to fit in right in the middle. So it has to cover all these different aspects, okay? And of course, another key element 
to the approach is um, embracing diversity. When we're talking about diversity, it's not just, you know, the different cultures, um, different age um, group. It's also about um, disciplinary backgrounds, so educational backgrounds. So it's all the dimensions of diversity, plus the different ways of working. So for example, sometimes you get people that are really good at monitoring and, and evaluation. You wanna make sure that in your team, you have somebody who's really good at, at doing um, monitoring and evaluation. Collaborators, coordinators, all these different ways of working are valuable and are critical to, um, to innovation. And research shows that um, teams with a variety of cognitive types have higher levels or produce higher levels of innovation. And of course, radical collaboration. And Africans say, if you want to go quickly, you go alone. And if you want to go far, um, you go together. So bringing in, breaking down silos and bringing in people and disciplines would otherwise not come together is part of this process. So we don't only rely on designers. We bring in designers, um, uh, people from the business world, um, science, scientists, everyone together. So making sure that your teams have maximum diversity is quite important. And of course, there's different models of collaboration as well. And typically the one that we use in the approach is the open and flat collaboration. By open collaboration, I mean that um, the team can start with a variety of skill set, but as they progress with the project, they might realize that um, there are certain skills that they do not uh, have in the team and therefore they can bring in other people to join the team. And flat collaboration means that the team makes decisions as a collective. And then of course, the, the, the other two approaches to collaboration is hierarchical, which is where typically a manager makes all the decisions and the team just implements what the manager asks them to do. And then close collaboration means that um, you have a, a team that is selected to work on the project and they focus on that. So what this um, human-centered design um, approach does is um, it affirms empathy. It's about an empathetic approach to innovation, which is about understanding. So typically when you are applying, when you are applying the approach, you have these three different kinds of empathy and they are all uh, valuable. They strengthen the, the, the process and they make working together in teams, in diverse and multidisciplinary teams. They help you understand each other. They help you be able to um, achieve your goal as a team. So empathy is at the core of the process. And of course, um, it's about true empathy. And of course, it's important to remember that it can be interrupted and blocked, but cannot be forced to occur. We try to um, cultivate empathy by introducing um, different ways of doing things and, and activities to help people get to that point where they truly connect and are able to move forward as a collective and work together towards a common goal. So at the core of the approach is the empathetic understanding of ourselves and our own biases and the understanding of the various stakeholders that are involved. And of course, understanding the context in which the problem exists in. And if you go online on Google and um, type design thinking process. Typically, this is what will come up. And maybe there's even other processes that I, I don't even know of. So each, it's, a, it's a process that is adaptable, basically. Anyone, um, depending on the context, people seem to find ways of designing it 
in such a way that fits their context. This is the one that I use. This is the process that I use. It, it's a very iterative process and it starts with understanding, gaining empathy, and then engaging with the various stakeholders that are involved in the, or that are part of the problem that they are trying to solve. And then synthesizing and making sense of the information that you've um, gathered. And then moving on to ideation and then prototyping and testing your ideas as, as fast as you can to make sure that you learn as quickly as possible. So the first three um, circles is about finding the right problem to solve. And the last three is about finding a solution. And throughout the process, you are diverging and converging in terms of your thinking, meaning that um, at times you are creating options. So you are putting a lot of information out there. And then of course you have to make choices as well. So you have to analyze and select um, the information. Typically the process feels a little bit like this at the beginning because there's a lot happening and often you're doing it under time constraint as well. But over time you gain clarity and start realizing and seeing where it's going. And it typically takes, um, I'd say a couple of hours to get to this point or in maybe around three hours or so to get to that point. And of course, one of the key things to this process is the notion of need finding. So typically, um, once you have gathered the information and you've um, unpacked it and you've synthesized it, the next step is to infer needs. And when we're talking about needs, we're not talking about solutions. And typically people, when um, they hear the word need, they think of a solution, but actually what we are, um, what we are trying to get to here is the underlying needs. So what is the real need be, be, what is the need behind the solution that you are proposing or you're suggesting? Because by understanding the core needs, you're able to solve for the, uh, and meet the needs of the people that you're designing for. So framing is quite important in the process of um, design thinking. And of course, these are some of the skills that one learns when they go through a, um, a design thinking training. Um, the World Economic Forum um, came up with these skills that they said would be um, critical in order for one to be able to survive the world of work in 2020, which is the year that we are in now. So complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, um, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision-making, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive uh, flexibility. And you'll notice here that um, in 2015, creativity was at number 10, but now in 2020, creativity is at number three. And this shows you the importance of our discipline, uh, the design discipline because um, we bring, we can bring a lot of creativity to some of the um, complex situations um, that we are dealing with. And of course, it's also about um, cultivating or developing uh, T-shaped individuals. Traditionally, we were trained to become, um, if you're trained as a designer, you become a designer for the rest of your life, but Today, in this day and age, people evolve, people change, and they learn various skills. They learn different ways of doing things. And so by having a T-shaped individual, these individuals um, contribute immensely towards um, tackling some of the problems that we, we've, we're facing. So the T is about um, one's ability to work, work across um, whether it's departments or projects and so forth, but also having the deep disciplinary knowledge, whether it's your um, architecture training or engineering training, 
but your ability to cultivating the ability for you to work with other people and work within a um, different context as well is quite important. So typically the training, the design thinking training starts with the introduction of tools and methods and then you apply. So it's a very, it's learning through doing basically in order to cultivate the mindset and then um, obviously get to the values because it's not about plugging and playing the process. It's about it becoming a way of being. That's what the training um, or at least the training that I do is all about. And of course, again, to reiterate the growth mindset. So collaboration and problem solving, embracing feedback culture is quite important. And then seeing failure as an opportunity to grow. And then creativity is quite important. Curiosity is at the core of it and empathy and flexibility and resilience um, and optimism. One has to be optimistic and always believe that something better could exist. And of course, the, an open mind and communication are quite important as well. And being able to analyze inform, information as well. And of course, contextual awareness, you have to be aware of the context in which you're designing, um, that you're designing solutions for. Otherwise, you don't want to end up with a solution that doesn't fit into the context that you are designing for. In terms of the, the principles, it's about embracing time as a positive constraint. We'll never have enough time to do things. So how do we use um, the limited time that we have to achieve the maximum? And it's about being human centric. So always putting people at the center of what you're trying to do. It's about the people and their needs. And then of course, there's this um, wonderful philosophy from um, Zimbabwe called Ukama, which is an outlook on life that life is an interconnected whole. The well-being of an individual can hardly be um, disentangled from the well-being of others. And this is important. It's not about me as an individual, it's about us, the collective. And then of course, the notion of building on the ideas of others, this can only happen if we learn to work with each other and truly collaborate so that we are able to come up with ideas that really make a difference. It's important to do that. And then of course, um, often, we like to discuss and, and overanalyze things. What this approach does is it forces you to act. So talk less and do more. And then of course, encouraging wild ideas, it's often the craziest ideas that lead to innovation or interesting innovations. And Africans say, smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. So allowing um, for experimentation and for crazy ideas to emerge is important. And then of course, um, going for quantity, it's about creating a variety of options to choose from. When you have a variety of options, you are likely to come up with better innovations. And then staying focused on the topic, you obviously do not wanna diverge beyond the scope of what um, you are allowed to do. So focusing, staying focused is quite important. That is why you'll find that in, in um, design thinking uh, trainings, there is a facilitator that is there to actually manage the process and make sure that everybody stays focused because sometimes we get, um, we digress. And then of course, the most important one, deferring judgment remembering that great events stem from words of no importance. So allowing people to share what their thoughts and ideas are, um, because it could be something that somebody else says that could trigger innovation as well. And then of course, being visual is quite important. And when I talk about being visual, it's not just about drawing pictures. It's about um, clarifying thoughts, it's about helping the brain understand things faster by making information visible. So you'll see 
in a design thinking training, we use a lot of vertical um, wall space because when you're working in diverse teams, you want everybody to be looking at the same information at the same time. That helps in terms of um, moving forward faster as a collective because you don't want to leave anyone behind. And of course, experimentation is quite important as well. Building um, low fidelity prototypes and testing those when you are developing solutions is quite important. And of course, just to reiterate that experimentation is an act of humility and acknowledgement that there's simply no way of knowing without trying something different. So allowing yourself to experiment and try something different is important. Um, and of course, another key um, aspect to this approach is the notion of place and space. So creating a place where people can come together and, and experiment, but also a space that is flexible, that allows for collaboration. So instead of um, a lot of the times people would build uh, and put, um, you know, big boardroom furniture. This approach just requires a simple space that allows for people to come together and share ideas and, and collaborate. Of course, um, the notion of um, cross-functional teams to break down silos and, and bring in a range of perspectives is quite important. And that's what the approach calls for. So instead of having a team of engineers solving an engineering pro problem, bring other disciplines as well, because they might bring a completely different perspective, which could help in terms of um, strengthening the solution that you're trying to um, develop. Okay, so this is um, it in terms of the introduction um, presentation that I had prepared. The one, uh, um, there are some examples that I, I will be happy to share with you when I get to, um, when we get to that point. Um, shall I continue oh. with the examples? Uh, just let's have a break and try to somehow wrap up and uh, try to digest this rich, rich kind of uh, information that you have just delivered. Excellent. Uh, Kinelli. Uh, I really liked it and uh, it has been very thorough and you have taken us through a very long, mashallah, uh, journey of trying to understand this concept and trying to uh, 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 get what is it. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we, we have learned a lot through this presentation or three days uh, through this session. And uh, it is a participatory and human-centered approach. It is uh, analyzing the roots of the problem uh, and uh, also solution-oriented mechanism. It is interactive and dynamic process. Mm -hmm. um, it requires interdisciplinary and multidimensional approach. Yeah. Uh, it also empowers the people uh, build their resiliency to different situations and to different uh, crises and ensure yeah. the ownership of the people. When you work yeah. with them, you ensure the ownership. You rightly said it. Uh, uh, it requires certain mindsets and methods, uh, changing culture also. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have learned that uh, you need to be visual. You need yeah. to build to learn and uh, talk less and do more, uh, participatory design approach. Uh, uh, as I said, it's also impressing diversity. So this is uh, yes. quite interesting. Uh, we really thank you for all that uh, rich information. We look forward to have in-depth discussion with uh, uh, Sudan Architecture Forum followers when you visit Sudan next time, would like really to listen and do it uh, uh, on ground. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, 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 uh, I hand it over back to you, Dr. Kenelwi, 
Uh, okay. If you want to take us to some experiences. Yeah. And uh, uh, we look forward to listening to those uh, direct examples for us to learn again. Over Great. to you. Great. Okay. So, um, can you see my screen? We okay. can see yes now. Okay, great. So in terms of um, in terms of my um, engagement on the continent um, around uh, this approach, this is just to give you an idea um, in terms of the organizations that I've worked with um, and training them at different levels. In some cases, um, especially the universities, training students um, um, to help them cultivate the entrepreneurial mindset. And then, um, and then other organizations working with them to help them develop their strategies, applying um, their approach. And in some cases, co-creating, teaching them how to co-create with communities to help them um, develop solutions to help communities develop their own solutions to their local problems. So these are some of the institutions that um, I've worked with before. What you will notice is that it's a wide variety of institutions from financial institutions to NGOs, to academic institutions, to big corporates. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a wide spectrum, and I am hoping that it helps you realize that the applicability of this approach is wide and varied. Um, and the projects they also vary in terms of complexity and um, and and simplicity. Okay, so um, typically these would be the problems that we're trying to solve. So for example, designing a way for government to support innovative, innovative solutions to the city's challenges in a world where disruptive industries can often drive residents um, or divide re residents rather than unite them. So this was a project that we did with the uh, Western Cape government to try and help them to, to think about um, how, do they, how can they support um, innovation that is happening around the city, whether it's um, individuals or, or um, institutions and organizations, how do, how do you encourage because in some cases, communities would take initiatives and start, for example, instead of waiting for government to come and, um, and fix a, a road or a leaking pipe or, or something, they'll take initiative. But a lot of the times, because um, government is the um, sort of um, the body that controls a lot of the times you'll find that um, communities will feel like government is not really, you know, is not being supportive or it's not being helpful. And so we went through a process of trying to get the um, government officials to work with communities and create a shared understanding and also realize that as a, as a government, Perhaps your role is not so much the implementation, but it's it's a it's creating an enabling environment. So you, government's role is to regulate. So understand the context and then come up with policies that respond to the the, the problems on the ground. And then um, and then another example of a project that I've worked on is um, the design a science center experience for youth. So this was a project that was um, aimed at um, children between the ages of seven to 18 
um, there was um, funding that was provided by um, Hasso Platner, the guy who started SAP in George. He wanted to build a community um, science center. So typically science centers are in the urban environments. What was different about this one is that it was going to be in a township, in one of the poor townships in the Western Cape. And so I made the suggestion that um, instead of just going in and building a wonderful you know, structure in a poor community, perhaps it might be helpful to first understand from those that are gonna be using the space as to what are they looking for in a science center? What would make them actually come to a science center? And what should it look like? What are the kind of experiences they are looking for? Because by understanding that, you're not gonna end up with a white elephant of a building that nobody is using, but you have a building that is a, a, a hive of activity where everybody is happy to come to because they feel like, and they can also protect it. And it was quite um, interesting because um, I just want to show you the example. So these were the kids that participated in the, in the workshop. And these are some of the ideas, prototypes that they developed in terms of, they started thinking about the space itself. What are the different areas and what would they want from those areas? So what do they want to learn? And what was interesting for me is that before I did the, um, the training with the kids, a lot of comments that I was receiving was that, um, oh, you know, these kids are from uh, poor communities. They don't know anything about science. That's why we're bringing the science center into their community. But through facilitating them uh, through a, an innovation process, what I came out with is the realization that when they are given the right tools, they're actually able to communicate their own understanding of science. And some of them were even talking about um, wanting to understand um, science in, in music and science in agriculture and science in all different aspects of science. And these were the same people that it was assumed that they were not um, their understanding of science was limited. So what design, the power of design lies in its ability to empower even the most um, marginalized person. It gives them a voice when it's done right. Um, and, and I believe that strongly because I've been um, working in various spaces in order for me to, to to understand that. And of course, um, some another example is this one, where we have this big financial institution in South Africa, that um, it's been in existence for years and years. And one of the things that um, they wanted to they wanted to make a contribution because there's been a lot of talks in South Africa that a lot of us will never be able to retire comfortably because we're not saving, we're not a saving nation. And so they wanted to use um, design thinking to understand what the real problems were and what solutions, what innovations can we come up with in order to help people um, save more. What was interesting through the research part of the design thinking process is that a lot of people made the comment that um, the products that are available or the vehicles that are available for saving, they don't take into consideration local cultures and practices. So for example, in South Africa, we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, communal and, and I'm sure it is the case, and I know that it is the case throughout the continent or even the world, where we do a lot of social um, 
activities together. So for example, if a person has a, you know, they're celebrating a milestone, a lot of the neighbors would come along and celebrate and participate in this. But when it comes to saving, the institutions are designing, are designing stuff around the individual. But a lot of the times people do stuff as a collective and if you want to encourage people to save, then you need to take into consideration the cultural practices. Because by tapping into what people are already doing in their social um, context, they're likely to embrace what you're proposing and it's likely to work better for them and meet their needs. And so it was about helping the organization to reframe and also to rethink the way they, um, they develop their solutions. And then, of course, another example is um, working with the VNA um, around inclusive spaces. So when they approached me with this project, their thinking was around um, how do we design an inclusive space so that um, we can get even more people coming into into the space. And through research, we realized that actually people don't have a problem with coming into the space. It's accessible, they are able to come. But the issue is around um, the inclusion of the low end employees. So the people that clean the space and the people that um, are security guards, they don't feel included, even though they spend most of their um, working hours in the space, they never experience the space themselves because they cannot afford it. So it was about getting the, the um, institution to also think about, because they are the ones who actually make the space what it is. That is why a lot of us enjoy this. Um, um, it's, it's known as one of the biggest tourist attractions in, in South Africa. And at the same time, it, the people that actually make it happen are not enjoying the same experience as the rest of us. So um, some of the, the, the final ideas were to create opportunities for the people that are actually making the space what it is for them to be able to experience it as well. So because there's a lot of retails and, um, and businesses in this area, it's easy to even get them to contribute to some of these um, incentives for the employees to make the space even better than it is. And then of course, one of the biggest ones is the water issue. I'm sure you've all heard about our water crisis in, in Cape Town. There was a time where we were so scared that um, our taps were gonna run dry and there was gonna be nothing left and there was gonna be no water coming out. What was interesting during this time is that um, a lot of um, designers and non-designers and politicians started coming together um, to engage and, and use design thinking to sort of unpack and, and come up with strategies and, and um, to make sure that we not only develop solutions that will help us um, re, um, reduce the crisis, but also change behaviors around uh, water usage. And what was interesting there was that a lot of the times people would save water when they're at home because they are paying for it. But when they are in the workplace, um, those, you know, just use water however they want to use it. And one of the things was to help people realize that it's the same water source. It doesn't matter where you are. So if you think you're playing your part by saving water at home and then you come to work, and then you waste water, it's the same thing. You're still wasting water. 
And what um, started happening is that um, there were so many initiatives happening, a lot of them driven by uh, designers, designers volunteering their services to assist and facilitate um, workshops and processes to help people um, learn more about um, you know, ways to, to reduce water usage. And there was a lot of other innovations like the hourglass, which helps you um, sort of watch the amount of time that you are spending in the shower. And, um, and I'm sure if um, those of you that have been to Cape Town, you've experienced it, where water just doesn't just um, run endlessly, but it's timed. There's all these interesting innovations that have um, come along as a result. But also what has started happening as well is, the, is that a lot of institutions, especially the, the big organizations started um, um, installing water tanks so that they can reduce their reliance on, on government for water. So water harvesting is now a big thing in Cape Town. Everywhere you go, you'll see water tanks where everybody is harvesting water, but also water recycling is another big thing. And yes, th so those are examples of the water situation. The other key thing um, which I think, I don't know if it's the same in your country as well, funding for education. That was a big thing in 2015. Students took to the streets and protested against um, the very inaccessible education, higher education in South Africa. And um, the protests resulted in a lot of um, changes and, and rethinking um, the education in general. And one of the, so apart from the funding, one of the key things that students had a, an issue with was that the education, the education that they are given is, it's still very much um, based on the colonial past and um, so they wanted education to be um, decolonized. And you'll hear a lot of that talk around decolonization of education in, in South Africa. So I worked on this um, project called um, Phoenix as a response to this funding of education. So this is a platform that we developed with one of the big financial institutions in, in South Africa, what it, it, it is, it's like a, a crowdfunding for students, a crowdfunding uh, platform for, for students. So what we, the problem that we were trying to solve here is uh, funding for students, but also moving um, or at least reducing the cost of um, Fin um, financial management, um, and because a lot of the times, if you, if something like this comes along, there would be consultants that are hired to manage the funds, and usually their cost is pretty high, and so by the time the money gets to the intended user, it's far reduced. What this platform does is it allows me as a citizen to fund a student directly. So if I, if, if, um, if I have extra funds available at the end of the month, I could go online and identify a student and see that this student either needs um, a huge amount so I can contribute a portion, but if I have the full amount, I can also contribute um, that full amount. So basically what the, the approach does is it allows <clears throat> us to be able to tackle some of the complex problems. They, like I said, they are never completely solved, but at least it allows us to come up with multiple interventions that can contribute towards solving the problem. 
And this one was also um, in the similar challenge around funding education. So this is an, a, a, a government initiative. So the South African government has this um, funding where as a student, you can get funding if you pass all your, um, your courses I think it's about 60% of the funding is converted into a bursary. So this is taxpayers' money basically that is used to fund education um, by government. But what was happening is that this organization was not getting the money back. So they'll fund people, but once the people start working, they don't pay the 40% the back. And so what we were trying to do is to try and encourage and motivate people to pay the money back by helping them realize that it's not just about them. So essentially it's about the, the people that are coming behind you if you don't pay back the money. So it's speaking to the listening of the, of the person that was funded. But what we also realized was that the organization itself, the system that they had didn't allow for people to, it was not about building relationships, whereas people were looking for relationship building so that they can have better connections um, and be able to continue engaging and be able to get the sense that they are contributing towards something bigger. So it's about, designing for participation and also designing in order to build relationships and build connections, designing for human needs, essentially. I think these are, there is way more examples that I could be talking about, um, but I feel like I've been talking a lot and um, yeah, I am going to stop there. Excellent. Once again, uh, Dr. Kinelwe, this is really interesting and uh, uh, really uh, encouraging to do lots of things, especially in our uh, country, Sudan. Uh, we learned a lot of issues and a lot of things, and we realized that this mechanism can help solving uh, multidimensional complex uh, issues, especially on the socioeconomic facets of lives. So uh, we really appreciate that uh, one hour plus uh, uh, informative uh, session. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the followers who attended online and uh, the ones who are going to attend later on, uh, they will uh, they will love the video and they will and they will approach us for further information. Uh, uh, Dr. Kinel, we I'm just having one or two uh, questions. Uh, Why sure. did you just to shed shed the light on that? Sure. Especially, uh, as you know, Sudan has just uh, uh, last year. Sudan uh, has undergone a, a huge change or considerable mm -hmm. change in mm -hmm. all in all facets of life, socio-economic. Uh, 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 it was big political change in the country, followed by lots of dynamics, uh, which is happening up to now. Yeah. And uh, the country is also is undergoing a very difficult uh, time uh, in terms of uh, economy and uh, social services. And um, uh, I mean, these days we are also encountering a uh, flood crisis. Yeah. We have the, the, one of the longest rivers, uh, rivers in the world, which is River mm -hmm. Nile, it's very famous. Mm -hmm. And it's flooding uh, many settlements along those uh, along the uh, the system of the river mm -hmm. line. So uh, I realized this approach, the design thinking mechanism, the design thinking uh, as a mindset, the design thinking as a, as a, uh, a way out to our day-to-day -day problems, to our uh, 
uh, recurrent issues and recurrent uh, socioeconomic issues and disasters, natural yeah. disasters like the one we are encountering these days, can also work and function. Uh, can you just uh, uh, shed some light on those kind of issues? Uh, because most of the people now that are just talking about uh, daily livelihood issues, service issues, yeah. These yeah. are really pressing, uh, uh, pressing issues in in the communities over there. Uh, people' expectations went very high after this political change in the country that took place started to take place since December 2018. Yeah. The country is now undergoing a huge transformation, political and socio-economic transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, this will settle soon. Uh, and people will uh, will get to uh, will get to the uh, the ambitious and uh, desires. Uh, we need to understand how this uh, how the design thinking approach can help achieving those uh, uh, expectations. How it can help the policymakers and the uh, and the community initiatives. There's a lot of community initiatives from professionals from uh, from young people, from uh, from uh, uh, local people in the neighbor different neighborhoods, uh, how this kind of mechanisms or tools can help uh, uh, transforming Sudan into really settled, uh, well-established uh, country. So we need to, in a five minutes <laughs> or, or That's a... uh, yeah. That's a very, very complex question that um, that I think the the best way to answer it is the same energy and rigor and um, energy that you guys used to achieve or to get to the point where you are now as a country, I think that energy can also be used, can be diverted towards tackling some of the issues. But of course, having a, um, an innovation um, strategy, having, a, a, um, having clear policies and um, being open and transparent is critical because what results in, in misalignment of expectations is the lack of transparency. If whoever you know, takes over um, the leading of the country, if they are open and, and transparent and, and remind the citizens of the country that it's not government alone, there is no way government that I, it doesn't matter which country you're from, there is no way government alone will be able to effect change. Everybody needs to be part of it. And it can start within the communities, smaller activities, um, smaller projects could lead to bigger impact. And this is where designers um, become even more critical, playing a role in all these different levels. And that role of being a mediator and facilitating strategies and facilitating um, these initiatives and, and activities. So it's about um, everybody coming together I mean, there's an example. Um, he, there was a a, um, a court case in in Cape Town recently, where government was taken to court by a community, one of the um, disadvantaged communities in in Cape Town, because government wanted to sell a piece of land, and these communities. It, when I say disadvantage, I mean, they don't have anything, but they came together and they mobilized and some designers joined in, some 
um, NGOs joined in, they came together as a collective to oppose what government was doing. And what they are doing in the in the piece of land, they're actually, they want to grow, um, they want to start a community garden. They want to, so there's all these little interventions that they want to do. And so it's about um, government realizing that their role is to create an enabling environment, not to be inter always interfering because it's communities themselves who have a better understanding of what works in their context. So it's about government being um, humbled enough to acknowledge the fact that if you are a minister or you are a politician, if you really wanna, um, if you really want to design or develop interventions that are meaningful and that makes a difference, then you have to be on the ground. If you can't be on the ground, then you cannot be imposing your own agendas and ideas without understanding the context. I hope that answers your question. Cool, Dr. Kinalwe, this is really interesting to know that uh... Uh, there's a way out to use these tools in our policy strategies with being uh, more open and transparent, uh, putting, uh, putting the communities themselves at the heart of the action. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think this is achievable in our case because there is a lot of initiatives going on. It only requires uh, some oversight from uh, policymakers to direct and deploy this uh, energy uh, and put them in, uh, uh, group them in platforms where they can deliver really effectively. Uh, for example, the Sudan Architecture Forum is uh, one of those initiatives. So uh, okay. it's used properly by the, through the community, through the official system. I'm sure it can deliver lots of uh, benefits. Uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, with more people learning uh, the process of design thinking, uh, uh, there will be more sound policies in place that's, uh, that was, that's being prepared based on community consultation, taking the, the local knowledge yeah. uh, and, and the, real, the real issues on the ground because- uh, And that is, is yeah, yes. and that that's that should be the the point of a policy should be responding to the needs of the people it shouldn't be just developing a policy for the sake of it it should be responding to the needs of the people and you can only um, develop a policy that responds to human needs if you engage with the people and you understand the context so it's about getting politicians to rethink their role. Their role is not to sit in parliament and, you know, have endless discussions. It's about understanding their constituencies and understanding the people that they are leading and understanding the challenges that those people are experiencing. So it's about, about being human, basically, being more empathetic and not only focusing on yourself as a leader, but focusing on the people that you are leading. Sorry for taking much of your time, but uh, we really can't leave you go, go away with all this information. Uh, probably <laughs> we, will, we will one day uh, invite you, as I told you, in the ground or we maybe conduct another session just to continue this interesting uh, dialogue. And maybe we will be having more people on board to interact with us on those kind of platforms, online platforms. What I like more about uh, the presentation is uh, in the, in the statement where you said, impressing diversity. Yeah. Uh, this is really uh, a fascinating one. And uh, it talks to itself. Uh, it goes, yani, it talks to uh, real issues uh, because the, 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 the problems 
are always very complex yes. and require and require the minds of many people to come together and yeah. provide inputs from different perspectives. Yeah. And uh, this is, I think, one of the things that we are lacking in Africa. I've been I've been experiencing managing some projects in West Africa and uh, North Africa as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I come across this team issue and team spirit and uh, and how we can collaborate together uh, mm -hmm. to deliver to deliver uh, solutions to the best of our ability uh, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, with uh, comprehensive uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, taking everybody on board. Yeah. Uh, everybody counts. Every mind counts. Yeah. So we really, uh, we really like that kind of uh, uh, thinking. The teamwork approach, the mm. diversity approach. So yeah. if you can, uh, if you can, uh, just in a one or two minutes before we mm -hmm. close out, uh, you can, uh, if you can shed a light on that as well. Yeah, so the the approach, the human-centered approach and the design thinking process becomes a common language for the diverse teams. Um, and it's about um, capitalizing on differences because often we see difference as a negative thing, but what this approach does is that it helps us realize that the the differences are what actually enriches the process because when we are trying to solve a problem let's say we are working on a water challenge i'm not an engineer i i only have a design background but by working with an engineer and working with a an anthropologist and working with a, um, you know, any a, an IT person, all of us together in one team, I learn it enriches um, the, the process, it enriches the experience. And as an individual, you grow because you learn a lot about yourself as well. But you also learn a lot about the problem that you're trying to solve from different perspectives. And also, it's not just about the team itself, but being able to go out and speak to even, you know, different stakeholders to get their perspective as well. So it's a continuous um, learning experience that is enriching and that um, enables the problem to be seen from different angles and different perspective. And that also applies when you, you are developing a solution as well because the solution is informed by different perspectives, it, it sort of, um, it becomes even a better solution. Okay, that has been a very interesting one and a half hour, Dr. Kinelwi. We really would like to thank you for that uh, patience and dedication and commitment being with us uh, along one and a half hour journey, sure. uh, try to support uh, Sudanese people uh, uh, in finding ways out at, uh, from the crisis and including the economic crisis and the natural disasters. Uh, these approaches are uh, applicable that have been used, applied, and experienced, uh, it has proved success uh, in different places around the globe. International organizations are uh, using it and the Tukinelwi is really supporting them in delivering those solutions into the ground. Uh, I would say uh, we, we need to take this kind of mechanism seriously uh, while developing our policies and strategies, while developing our cities while yeah. developing our uh, our uh, villages, while developing our agriculture, our industry, our uh, uh, economy, education, health, so it works for all sectors, uh, and uh, 
it's a, it's a, uh, it works across sectors and in a multidisciplinary way. So uh, we really encourage uh, all professionals, all policymakers, even the people on the grassroots working with the communities, uh, the committees. Uh, we have active service committees on the ground. So we really call upon all of them uh, to uh, come and educate themselves about this kind of uh, approaches, mix it with their local knowledge, uh, mm. and take it forward. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Kinelwi, for this very enriching and enlightening one and a half hour. We look forward uh, uh, to meet you again in person. And I'm sure SAF followers are very glad that this, this not SAF only followers, but many people who will be able to watch uh, this video from our online resources. And they will be more than happy uh, to uh, uh, listen and watch uh, the, uh, to uh, Dr. Kinelwi. Uh, thank you once again. We, we were more than glad hosting you. And uh, we look forward to meet you again. Thank you, Dr. Kinelwi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. Have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Lovely spending thank you. an hour and a half with you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Same to you.